Our speaker tonight was born in Hungary in 1948, and his first book of poems, The Slant Door, published in 1979, was winner of the Faber Prize. He has published many books since then, including Real, R-E-E-L, uh, from 2004, which won the T.S. Eliot Prize, a prize for which he has been twice shortlisted since. His books have appeared in multiple languages and won prizes in Hungary, Romania, and China. His memoir of his mother, The Photographer at 16, published in 2019, was awarded the James Tate Black Prize for Biography in 2020. He began translating on his return to Hungary in 1984, initially primarily poetry, then Imre Madach's The Tragedy of Man, a 19th century verse play for which he was awarded major prizes, uh, plural. He has worked across literary genres, including poetry and the novel, publishing dozens of works in translation over the course of his career, including by Costolani, Crudi, Maroy, Sabo, and Krasna Horkai. He was awarded the Translator's Prize at the International Booker in 2015, has edited and co-edited various anthologies of Hungarian writing, and was just a member of the jury for this year's International Booker Prize, which we will hear more about. Please join me virtually in welcoming, welcoming George Sartiz. Thank you very much indeed. It's a privilege to be asked to do this lecture. It's a strange title, I admit, and how to mind one's own and other people's business. Um, but as uh, Rebecca said, I started off as a poet and I sort of blundered into translation. Um, now, she just mentioned the International Booker Prize, and so I might as well. I was one of the members of five, jury of five at the uh, 2021 Booker Prize, and the winner of that was very recently announced. That's why I think I'll begin there. There are three reasons for that. First, because the most admired books tended to be hybrids of one sort or another rather than straight fiction, to the extent that some might wonder if they were fiction at all, rather than essay, memoir, revolutionary tract or imaginary survey. And that's just considering the shortlist. It seemed to us that the most interesting writing was coming from the borders of the novel. Borders were interesting and exciting. Work of the borders might perhaps be described as the products of the laboratory of the imagination rather than of the shop. And maybe all good writing is produced in a laboratory of the imagination, though some laboratories are more specialized than others. We as a jury tended to prefer the smell, if you like, of the lab to the smell of the shop. The shop could take care of itself, the hybrids, might be more difficult to assign to specific shelves, but they were more exciting. Now, second, not having all the languages at our command, we were not in a position to offer views on the quality of translation itself, except in a few specific instances. We were, in effect, judging translated books rather than the translations of the books. There is a difference, simply, as readers, despite our own greater or lesser familiarity with the laboratory of translation, we were more concerned, partly because we were reading 25 books each month with the book as presented to us. In other words, as an item in a bookshop. I don't mean as a bestseller, simply as something that could be found there. Now, the distinction between lab and shop is a distinction I will return to. There being no Hungarian books at all submitted, my own supposed expertise was beside the point. There were certainly books that seemed to have demanded virtuosic work on behalf of the translator, but generally speaking, the work of the translator, like the work of the typographer, the people who set the book, tended to invisibility. Now, this did not mean that we regard the, the books as work that might just as easily have been produced here. Apart from the setting and cultural reference points, there was about all of them a the sense of unfamiliarity, a resetting of the landscape of the imagination, the voice and scope. And indeed, it was an entirely different landscape. Though we were reading English words, there was a different energy running through them. There was no 
obvious sense of domestication. I'm of course, aware that there has been considerable debate about the degree of security with which translators should lodge their translations in the receiving language, especially in a case of an ex-imperial language like English. And that there was always a question of cultural appropriation. All I would say on that is between ourselves. You have no idea how much a Hungarian writer longs to be appropriated. I don't think most writers want to stay in a highly theorized lab. They're not specimens. They would rather like, ideally on their own terms or close to their own terms, to enter the bloodstream of this or that foreign language leadership, the way the great Czech poet Miroslav Holub did, who, slightly tongue in cheek perhaps, said that some of the translations of his poems were better than the original. There is in fact a third reason for starting with the International Book Up. The book, All at Night All Blood is Black, translated by the American poet Anna Moskovakis, the winner of the 2021 prize, David Diop, has something to say about translation. Diop, who writes in French, was born in France to a French mother and a Senegalese father but spent his childhood in Senegal before returning to France. French is the official language of Senegal, but is spoken by only a small minority of people. The most common spoken language among over 30 others is Wolof. In other words, Diop himself is a product of translation. If the wonderfully energetic, resonant and hypnotic English of his translator is anything to go by, Diop's language must be an energetic, resonant and hypnotic French. The book is about a couple of Senegalese soldiers, related by tribe and village, who regard each other as more than brothers or soul brothers. The original French title of the book is Frère Dame. Their language is Wolof, not French. The powerful and handsome Alpha are a narrator through most of the book, and a slighter figure of Mademba are among the 135,000 Senegalese tirailleurs or infantrymen fighting in mixed colonial regiments alongside French troops in the First World War. Mademba is fatally wounded and begs Alpha to put him out of his misery. Slit my throat, he pleads. Alpha can't bear to do so, but slits a few enemy throats instead. So Madamba dies a lingering death. This trauma, combined with all the other acts of unbearable violence, produces a psychosis in Alpha, whose acts of ferocity take a turn in madness and a spell in a recovery camp. The book is a tracing through of that psychosis. Here, at the end of the book, Alpha is under interrogation at the recovery camp. And now I will quote. They asked me my name, but I'm waiting for them to reveal it to me. I swear to you that I no longer know who I am. I can only tell them what I feel. I believe from looking at my arms like mango trees and my legs like baobabs that I am a great destroyer of life. I swear to you that I get the sense that nothing can resist me, that I am immortal, that I could pulverize boulders just by squeezing them in my arms. I swear to you that what I'm feeling can't be said simply. The words which I could say are insufficient. So I resort to words that might seem foreign for what I want to say. Because at least by chance, despite what they ordinarily signify, they might translate what it is I feel. For the moment, I'm only what my body feels. My body is trying to speak through my mouth. I don't know who I am, but I think I know what my body would say about me. He goes on. 
To translate is never simple. To translate is to betray at the borders. It's to cheat, it's to trade one sentence for another. To translate is one of the only human activities in which one is required to lie about the details to convey the truth at large. To translate is to risk understanding better than others that the truth about a word is not single, but double, even triple, quadruple, or quintuple. To translate is to distance oneself from God's truth, which, as everyone knows or believes, is single. What did he say? Everyone asked. This is not the response we expected. The response we expected wouldn't be more than two words, possibly three. Everyone has a last name and a first name, two first names at most. The translator hesitated, intimidated by the angry, worried looks being shot his way. He cleared his throat and answered the uniforms in a small, nearly inaudible voice. He said that he is both death and life. End of quote. For the moment, I am only what my body feels. My body is trying to speak through my mouth. Felt meaning is a phrase George Steiner uses in After Babel. Rather silence than a betrayal of felt meaning, he says, talking of translations of Hölderlin. Felt meaning is not lexicography. It is, by its very nature, difficult to define. Like lab and shop, and indeed body, it is a term I will want to return to. I'm including two or three very short poems in this talk, and here's the first of them on translation. Translating a night with its soft, dark furnishings is delicate work. One wrong, careless touch, and it recoils. It won't be construed or spelled out. Its colors are dim memories of previous nights, not this one. At night, you search for the words. Okay, in what forms do we meet translation normally? We meet it abroad, we meet it at home with foreign visitors, we meet it in instructions on imported packages for preserving or constructing, and titles to films. We meet it through the wary, precise work of interpreters at complex political summits. We marvel at it in simultaneous translation at conferences. We need it to understand legal and contractual matters. We may need it to understand the local dialects of our own language. We certainly need it when listening to politicians and publicists. I'll give you a short verse comment on that. Weasel speak, weasel words, suck the eggs of honest birds. Weasel's mission to explain entails excision of the brain. Weasel truths are not quite lies, but all the same, the patient dies. But long before all that, we meet translation as infants, when we translate fears and desires into those magical counters, words. One word, milk, is enough to conjure real milk. A hey, presto, milk appears. Our prelinguistic infant son used the word uki to mean milk. We knew what he wanted because he pointed to it. He had devised a perfectly functioning one-word idiolect that socialization would quickly make redundant. Ugi is another word I will return to. We know that language is a complex code in which there is no necessary connection between the sound we make, the sign we write, and the thing we wish to denote. The incidental details of language can seem terrifyingly arbitrary at times. We have, may have made the experience, or the experiment 
that children make of repeating a word several times over. Saying the word over and over is like holding water in cupped hands. The water begins to leak. And soon there is nothing left except a sound and a shape of mouth in a mirror full of white noise. We live at the edge of linguistic chaos. <clears throat> Language escapes us. It is distinctly habitable parallel world, but we don't always live there. Language, as Diop's character realizes, is vital to his identity in that it offers a reassuringly mappable point in the world to the degree that Alpha's sanity depends on it. But the map is wrong. It has been torn up. I was born in Budapest after the war, as you've heard. We lived near the city centre in a third floor flat in a side street in the same postal district as the wartime ghetto. The buildings were rather grandiose 19th century apartment blocks that had gained dignity through destruction. Elevations were pockmarked with shell and bullet holes. Their stucco statuary lacked arms, legs, or heads. Buildings had to be held up by dense forests of wooden scaffolding. Street on street of it made both landscape and map, the accumulated features of which were parts of language to me. So the physical world, the bodily, becomes an internalized grammar. Steiner's felt language. The spoken language was Hungarian, of course, a language spoken nowhere else in the world, a language as complex as the architecture with its own pitch, depth, lilt, rhythm, and color. What I heard and saw as a child were aspects of the same sense of being in the world. Back in 1956, I possessed at least one bilingual book, A.A. Milne's Now We Are Six. Milne was remarkably popular, even under communism. Winnie the Pooh and all its hums and rhymes were translated by the virtuosic pre-war humorist, Friedrich Carinthi. The three English words I particularly remember of it were all on one page. They were in capitals. And, but, so. I enjoyed saying them, even while mispronouncing them. The Hungarian text told me what they meant, but as sheer sound, they might as well have been Ugi, our infant son, for our infant son's word for milk. Coming to England in 1956 was a language shock. Suddenly, we found ourselves in a whole forest of oogies that left my younger brother completely silent for the first three months. Our parents had decided to speak English to us as soon as they could. I was a quick learner then, and in less than a year, English slipped in as the Hungarian slipped out. The two languages passed each other at the door without even noticing each other or nodding to each other. I have no memory at all of the liminal process. Maybe it was partly subliminal. School was a testing ground. I made mistakes. I wondered why someone should have taken a wicked with a D rather than a wicket with a T. And our bicycle tire might punch back when it suffered a puncture, the puncture, the puncture. They were the kind of mistake that Vladimir Nabokov found the most now, as he writes in The Art of Translation on the Sins of Translation in the great Russian short story published in 1941, quote, three grades of evil can be discerned in the queer world of verbal transmigration. The first and lesser one comprises obvious errors due to ignorance or of misguided knowledge. This is mere human frailty and thus excusable. The next step to hell 
is taken by the translator who intentionally skips words or passages that he does not bother to understand or that might seem obscure or obscene to vaguely imagined readers. He accepts the blank look that his dictionary gives him without any qualms or subject scholarship to primness. He is ready to know less than the author as he is to think he knows better. The third and worst degree of turpitude is reached when a masterpiece is planished and pattered into such a shape, vilely beautified, in such a fashion as to conform to the notions and prejudices of a given public. Or he here comes, strutting and shooting out his bejeweled cuffs, the slick translator who arranges Scheherazade's boudoir according to his own taste, and with professional elegance tries to improve the looks of his victims. Thus it was the rule with Russian versions of Shakespeare to give Ophelia richer flowers than the poor weeds she found. I was in no position to commit the more grievous second and third signs at the age of eight. The first was trouble enough. Mishearings were occasions for laughter, teasing, and the occasional shame of being regarded as the exotic dimwit of my junior class. Nevertheless, I proceeded as a matter of learning manners, learning rules, learning games, learning how to spot a bus, to identify cars, to take a position on either steam or diesel trains, meeting the Christian Bible and the Christian God, learning the elements of irony and passing the 11 plus. Now, English words were becoming more familiar, more ready to serve, more willing to form orderly cues and to lay out the kind of social card that I could walk on with some sense of confidence. English was becoming normal, far more normal and the landscape. I don't think I ever felt at home with London suburbs. Terraces with small fronts and bigger back gardens never did become natural terrain. That level of fully internalized physical language, the physical language that conditions spoken language, was stuck somewhere in a limbo, along with all the lives that occupied it. It was normality, but at a distance. Poetry, my trade, thrives on a simultaneous defamiliarization of things and language. That defamiliarization is what gives poetry its slim but electric life. It is a way of re-experiencing life as shock in the gap between language and what happens. Seamus Heaney recalled the giant Finn McCool describing the finest music as the music of what happens. That happening happens in the tension between what there is and what we say about it. Language in poetry remembers its own arbitrariness. It remembers that milk, the word, is as strange a sound as oogie. There is a masterly parody of John Bell, the English poet of the mid-century, by Charles Causley. I want to quote the last two verses of that, and I'd like you to listen at for the way that Causley's Betjeman, the character he creates, turns the most familiar things, Mazawati T, Marks and Spencer, British Railways, Luton, the names Beverly and Daphne, into exoticisms, personal oogies that keep his language alive. Quote, take your ease, pale haired admirer, as I, half the century saner, pour a vintage Mazawati through the Marks and Spencer strainer in a genuine British Railways Luton made cardboard container. Though they say my verse compulsion lacks an interstellar drive, Reading Beverly and Daphne keeps my sense of words alive. Lord, but how much beauty was there back 
1955. The Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, as I understand it, suggests that the structure of a language forms or at least influences the speaker's worldview or cognition. One scholar, interested in the fact that though born into Hungary and I was writing poems in English, put it to me that my change of language might have triggered the restructuring of reality. It may be that unconscious restructuring does something to keep one's sense of words alive, as Causley says. Something has to remain foreign or just foreign enough to keep a poet working at the electric edges of language. I'm aware that there is an argument for the foreignization of translated texts. Foreignization suggests that translators should always remind their readers that they are reading a foreign, not an English author. Refuse them to read cups of milk tea, make them walk down a rue or strasse rather than a road. And if they don't know what the Hungarian words ut, utsa, or tear mean, road, street, square, let them down well look it up. To return to my earlier terms, I think that's a lab rather than a street or shop argument in that it makes best sense in the lab. Out in the street and in the shop, they don't pay much attention to this argument. And I suspect that for an author, prefer it that way. Ideally, they'd like to be in a shop in your street. Here's another short poem titled Foreign. Lost in translation, somewhere along the journey between sleep and sleep, the stillness of leaves, the speed of the passing car, the surface of flint caught in a moment of inattention, language seeking its first words in a foreign language. Returning to Hungary in 1984, there's a poet with three books behind me at that stage and an Arts Council grant in my pocket. I was warmly greeted by Hungarian pen. The visit proved a revelation and changed my life in profound and practical ways. I've mentioned how the early landscape of Budapest remained with me after the spoken language left. Now here it was again, glowing and poignant, immediately recognizable, more recognizable in fact than the language, which was as much noise as sense. My grasp of my long disused Hungarian might have been about 50% understanding, but my ability to speak was closer to 10%. It was the 10% that fueled the rest, but it was the townscape that moved me to tears. On the last night of our stay, the British Council threw a party for me, at which I my poems in English. After it, the editor of the new Hungarian Quarterly, an English language cultural magazine, asked me if I was willing to translate some poems for the magazine. I told him my Hungarian was poor, but he assured me that I would receive literal cribs along with the notes. I was so overwhelmed by the experience of the visit that I probably would have said yes to anything he suggested. So I said yes. I had begun to write my own poems in 1966. I wasn't doing English at school and I didn't do English at university. So I read entirely for myself, along with a couple of other boys who, like me, were studying sciences at A-level but had fallen in love with poetry. We prodded each other's reading along, according to our individual discoveries. Keats and Don were there, as were the American Beats, the Liverpool poets, Oddments, like a 19th century throwback to Lovell Beddo, who wrote the enticingly titled Death's Jest Book, as well as a decent scheme of the various penguin books of translated poetry from the French, German, Italian and Spanish anthologies of various centuries through to individual volumes by Avtushenko, Prevet, Rilke and the rest, most of them still sitting on my shelf. Some editions were bilingual, some in English only. Some had verse translations, some prose cribs 
at the bottom of the page. To be frank, I did not differentiate greatly between English poets and the foreign poets I read in English translation. Poetry then was something poets perceived in the white noise of the world rather than construction specific to language. By 1984, my attitude to the range of translation methods promoted by Penguin and other publishers, not so much the prose cribs as the generalized verse translations, verse without the formal features of verse, had hardened a little. They seem to be based not only on the premise that content could be detached from form, but it was actually preferable that it should be. Certain aspects of the poem were, in other words, intrinsic, others extrinsic. The translator's task was to convey the former and discard the latter. The product seemed to me then a kind of universal free verse floating in mid 20th century air. Excuse me. That was <clears throat> what Brodsky later complained about in translations of Mandelstam. Mandelstam, to whom I will return, was, he asserted, a formal poet, more like Brodsky himself, who was being translated, by the way, by formerly virtuosic poets like Anthony Hecht and Richard Wilbur and so on. Existing Mandelstam translations conveyed something of Mandelstam but missed out something equally important, a quality of temperament and address. They missed out something of the classical formality that Brodsky heard in Mandelstam. By 1984, <clears throat> I myself had become a frequent user of formal verse, by which I mean verse with a clear sense of underlying architecture. Poems in this sense are products of the tension between sentences and potentially rhymed, but not necessarily end stopped, metrical lines. Rhyme, I had learned, was not decoration, not something stuck at the end of a line as an afterthought. It was at the heart of structure, governing what could be said and where. It was the way thought developed. It's very arbitrariness one word happens to sound like another, was an echo of the arbitrariness of language itself. It could lead to new thought and new feeling. Regarding translation out of the Hungarian, and I want to deal with this very briefly, there were two considerations in my mind. First, that Hungarian is an isolated language spoken by very few, that very little had been translated, and that whatever I translated was likely to be translated for the first time. That imposed an obligation in me to produce something that even in English might sound somewhat like the familiar Hungarian sounded to a Hungarian. The Hungarian approach to translation was itself based on close imitation form for form, including rhyme, meter, seizures, and all. It wasn't really production furniture. It worked because the translators, inevitably other poets, were not simply tracing the surface of the poem, but following the path the original poet took in the poem's development. I decided to try it, if only because I was used to it and because I thought the difficulties of English rhyme were overstated. If nothing else, it would be good to balance it against the universal free verse poem floating in mid 20th century air. It was, if you like, a body response as much as an intellectual one. Rather silence than a betrayal of felt meaning, said Steiner. Well, I would try it, as I felt it, bodily. It was hit and miss at the start, and of course, not everything I was given demanded the same formal approach. I'll give just one example that did seem to call for it. The longest work I was presented was a 19th century verse play as Ember Tragediae, 
to the tragedy of man by a poet, Imre Modaj. There were at least two other versions available. The play has a status of Shakespeare in Hungary and is studied, quoted, and memorized by school children throughout the country. When the play begins, we are in heaven with God and the angelic choir, with Lucifer waiting in the wings. The angelic host sings, and I'll give you a few lines of that in Hungarian. Mien büszke láng golyója, ön fényében elbizottan, s egy szerény csillag csoportnak épő szolgál öntudatlan. Pislag-e parányi csillag, azt hinnéd egy gyönge lámpa, s mégis millió teremtés mérhetetlen nagyvilága. Két golyó küzd egymás ellen, összehullni, szétsietni, se küzd is a nagyszerű fék pályáján tovább vezetni. Here's a translation, angelic host. Look at that brave ball of fire, so overweening its effulgence, unaware it merely serves some distant galaxy's indulgence. This, you'd think a feeble lantern, a winking, blinking little planet, but oh, how huge it seems to those unnumbered souls that thrive upon it. Two spheres contend with one another, rush close, repel, and sharply veering, spin away. Their opposition steers them through such wild careering. An, apolog an apologia of sorts here. Almost all the translations I've done from Hungarian from 16th century verse through to contemporary poetry and fiction has, in my mind, been intended for the shop, the bookshop, not the lab. I wanted Hungarian writers, nearly all first timers in English, to be read and enjoyed by people in streets and shops rather than debated by scholars and theorists. I felt I owed that to the originals as loved by readers. I felt no need to foreignize them. None of them sounded English to me. Once other later translations had been produced, did my authors get that far, the variants could generate their own polyphony, including foreignized versions. They just had to get into the shops first. It is different with well-known texts from major European languages. Variants already exist. Translations of Dante, Rilke, loads of them. The obligation is less to produce another close variant, but to see where the work might lead. Now that is lab work, much of work. So the translations may be peripheral and possibly eccentric. Some might even escape from the lab. So I earn my talk with of these. This is based on a single quatrain, one of four lines, by Josip Mandelstam from Internal Exile in Voronezh. That's where Stalin sent him. I was asked to translate it by a Russian friend, Veronika Krasnova, who provided the Russian Cyrillic text, a phonetic text, a literal translation, Richard McCain's translation, and a page full of background. I needed all that because I don't speak or read Russian. The poem, she told me, is devilishly playful, full of assonance and puns. It is impossible, she said. Reading all she had given me, I agreed to try, but then decided to do it in several versions. Reading them all, one may be able to somehow triangulate, or more than triangulate, since there were seven variations, the area or landscape of the poem. Now I'm going to try and put this picture up. Um, so you'll see the text. This you'll see uh, Krasnova's transliteration, her literal and some vocabulary, and I'll show you um, the um, Okay, you should be able to see that. Um, so this is uh, Veronica trying to give me um, a phonetic kind of version. Pusti menya, attaj menya varonish, uronish timenya, il provoronish, 
Tiverones menya, il vernios, verones, plage, verones, boron, nor. Literal translation is um, let me go, give me back, Voronezh, whether you drop me or lose me, whether you let me slip or return me, Voronezh, a whim, Voronezh, raven, knife. And then she gives me a glossary. Vor um, is thief, Voron, raven, Voronok is a little raven, but it's also the name for the black cars used by the secret police. And Norj is a knife. Now you can see that the Voronish sound, Voronish, etc., etc., is repeated and repeated, and it's witty and it's funny, and it's written from exile, where he's going to die. So here are five of the seven variations Raven, Voron, Norj, blade. Winds me out, rewinds me. The blade must fall, the ravens free, it binds me, returns, revenues, misses me and finds me. Verone is your raven's blade, whose whim defines me. <coughs> Voron, a raven, nourish, a snitch, ditched by Voronej, like unstitched leaves, reached by Voronej, rehitched, stitched by the bitch Voronej, the raven with a snitch. Raven's ditch, Raven's brook, Raven's beak. Let me go, let me come, or else you will seek me in vain, Voronezh, having dropped my life on a whim, Raven whose beak is sharp as a knife. Alternatively, crow, the crow's bright blade. Will you crow now, Voronezh, now I have gone? Will you drop me or gather me in your masquerade? Crow, joker with your sharp beak of black crow shade. Let me go. Return me to my lost home, Voronezh. I'm still yours, though you drop me, you black joke, Voronezh. You cannot stop me singing, even under your crow black dome. So, to the end. So the points I wanted to explore in this talk, from the point of view of a who happens to have found himself translating rather than as a dedicated translator, although he carries on translating, arose out of two main areas of translation complicated by a third. As a translation translator of fiction from my little known European language, my task, as that of the translators in the Booker International Fiction Prize was to become close to invisibility in expanding the readership um, of my authors without flattening them out into some universal idea of English. It was the shop aspect. Get the books into shops and have them be read. This would apply to my translations of Hungarian poetry too, in a lesser way, Although ideas of fidelity are more complex and more prominent in poetry in terms of form and other things. The laboratory or lab idea is less concerned with shops and the broad readership. That responsibility is reduced. The lab involves investigations and games with the protean nature of language itself and its capacity to suggest and modify or even evade meaning, and indeed question the nature of meaning. This is then complicated by the third aspect, that of felt meaning, a meaning that arises not only out of language, but circumstance, the reference points of language, the streets and squares of meaning, if you like. The lab foregrounds the translator and the act of translation. The shop offers invisible translators and hides the act of translating. The products of the lab can, and perhaps should, influence what gets into the shop. The best of the fiction presented to us for the booker was not the product of the lab, but retained the faint 
but heady, even slightly dangerous smell of the lab somewhere in its very tension. My instinct is that labs and shops, so labs are labs and shops are shops, but that the spirit of the lab can sometimes leak in a productive way. And probably should be leaking. Thank you very much.